Chapter 1. I'm not waving. I'm drowning. When deep water meets even deeper love. She had struggled from childhood with overpowering feelings of melancholy. As an adult, it was no better. British poet Stevie Smith traced much of her struggle to a difficult childhood and to the devastation that swept over her after her father abandoned the family. Her most famous poem lent its title to a collection she published in 1957. She called it simply, Not Waving, But Drowning. Her brief, twelve-line poem pictures a dying man thrashing about in the surf, gesturing wildly, yet unable to attract the help of people passing by on the shore. The passerby see him, but they suppose he's merely waving, and so they walk on, maybe even waving back, leaving him to drown. The poem ends with these desolate lines. I was much too far out all my life, and not waving, but drowning. Have you ever felt like that? I have. Sometimes I still do. Despite the fierce love of Jesus and the measureless grace of God, sometimes I thrust my hands up in the air, my arms flailing wildly, and people nod and smile and return what they see as a wave but I'm not waving. I'm drowning. Even for those of us who've walked with Christ for years, wounds from the past can still rush in like an unexpected storm. In just the past couple of weeks, for example, the water started to rise as I returned from a weekend speaking engagement. As is my custom, I texted my husband, landed when the wheels of the plane touched down in the tarmac. I've come to expect his return message, yay! This time he added that he was picking up our son from a sleepover at his best friend's house. At a little after 10 p.m., I retrieved my bag and headed out to my car. We live about 30 minutes from the airport, so I felt sure Barry and Christian would beat me home. As I turned into our driveway, however, the house was dark. What a desolate feeling, seeing a dark house where I expected welcome lights flooding from the window. Oh well, I told myself, it's probably taking longer than expected to retrieve Christian stuff from places only teenage boys would think to leave them. I shrugged off the small wave of fear and busied myself with unpacking. By 11 o'clock, however, I still hadn't heard anything. I called Barry's cell, but he didn't pick up. I texted him, where are you guys? Nothing, no reply. When by almost midnight I still hadn't heard anything, I felt the water rising over my head and the suffocating fingers of panic close in around my throat. It's an all-too-familiar emotion. It's the hated voice way down in the cellar of my soul whispering, They're gone. You've always known it would happen one day. You lose what you love, Sheila. Always have. Always will. I felt myself going under for the third time when a few minutes later I finally heard Barry's car pulling into the garage. It could have been, should have been, a moment of warmth and joy, a happy and relieved family reunion complete with a group hug. But it wasn't. Paralyzed by fear, instead of reaching out to my husband, I turned away, hiding in my own private cell. Instead of receiving a warm greeting from a wife, deeply grateful he'd arrived home safely, My husband wore the silence of questions I didn't know how to ask. When I did find a voice, I threw my questions randomly into the air, meaning them as flares, but they stung like arrows. I have often found anger more comfortable than fear. Anger gives me the illusion of control, while fear leaves me naked and exposed. When the waves finally subsided, I found myself in a puddle of shame. Why did I react like that? Have I learned nothing over the years? How could I lose my footing so quickly? Barry had stayed with friends longer than expected to talk with them about a distressing storm of their own. He had also thought I might appreciate a little time to myself after a tiring weekend. Now, wasn't that ironic? I had just returned from telling 10,000 women that Christ offers peace in the fiercest storm And now my own words battered me. I'm not waving. I'm drowning. Unlearning old lessons. Over the years, I've learned that while Jesus' love remains constant, our experience of that love does not. 
That's a big problem for many of us because we grew up thinking that once we learned whatever lessons God wanted to teach us, we could sail through life triumphantly on a golden cloud regardless of the serious challenges or difficulties that knocked on or knocked down our doors. Maybe you have pleaded with God as I have. Lord, I've learned this lesson. I really have. So can we move on, please? Moving on, however, isn't always an option. Life is what it is. Our challenges are what they are. And the big changes we long for so intently may take place within us rather than around us in our circumstances. It's taken me a while to get that lesson. Truth be told, I'm still learning. On the other hand, please don't imagine that my life swings wildly from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. Actually, some of the situations in which I find myself can even seem quite funny, at least after a little time has passed. A few years ago, I received an invitation to take part in a crusade in London, England. Pastor Yonggi Cho from Seoul, South Korea, would do the main speaking while I would do the singing. Since I love any opportunity to return to my homeland, I felt excited that the event would take place in the magnificent new 20,000-seat O2 Arena. I flew in the day before, and as we drove to the hotel, I asked the local event planner when I could do a sound check. He said he would take me over to the venue the following afternoon. When the knock came at my door at 3 p.m., I quickly grabbed my things, ready to leave for the arena. But it wasn't the event planner at my door. It was a small greeting committee. They said they'd just come from Dr. Cho's room and would like to come in and chat for a few moments. I invited them in, and after an awkward silence, one man cleared his throat and declared there'd been a slight change of plan. In retrospect, it would have been like one of the sailors on Jonah's storm-tossed ship telling the prophet, there's a little fish just over the other side of the boat that would love to say hello. They told me that rather than promote the event themselves, they had hoped God would do the promoting, but apparently he hadn't. The gentleman explained that because of the change in circumstances, there would be a change of venue. Instead of meeting in the O2 Arena, we would hold forth at Peckham High School. That's like going from the Cowboy Stadium in Dallas, Texas, to your local 7-Eleven. That's absolutely fine with me, I replied. Well, I spoke too soon. Well, he continued, we were hoping you wouldn't mind going over to the arena and standing outside with a sign saying the event's been moved just in case anyone shows up. Just wave it as high as you can. Am I hearing this correctly? I politely declined that opportunity and settled instead for singing through a bullhorn in the school gym. Horrifying at the time, but quite funny now. What's it doing in God's Word? Let's admit right now that a lively wave of the hand often doesn't mean hello. Sometimes it can mean help. I think that's especially true when life fails to turn out like we thought it would. Perhaps we began our Christian lives with great dreams, soaring hopes, and fervent anticipation. But somewhere down the line, our dreams decayed, our hopes got hammered, and our anticipation all but vanished into the abyss. Crushed expectations can leave us feeling desperate, despairing, and desolate. Have you ever read Psalm 88? It isn't likely you'll see the words of this psalm on a wall plaque or in a framed cross stitch in the family room. This psalm of lament could give even psalms of lament a bad name. While most such songs start out with some kind of desperate plea, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? They normally end in praise, or at least with a little hope. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. That's Psalm 13, verses 1 and 6. But not so in Psalm 88. Yes, it definitely opens with a plea for help. Day and night I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you, turn your ear to my cry. But you will look in vain at the end of this song for praise, for hope, or even for a teensy bit of light. The writer describes God's wrath sweeping over him and the Lord's terrors destroying him, surrounding him, completely engulfing him. And then comes verse 
18. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me, and darkness is my closest friend. And that's it. End of psalm. Period. When was the last time you saw anyone use that verse to conclude a worship service? I never have, and I'm pretty sure you haven't either. So why did God include Psalm 88 in his words? Why is it even there? Do we have so little hardship and pain in this life that we have to read about it in the scriptures? I told you in this book's introduction that I wouldn't offer you a nice, tidy system of beliefs that heals all wounds, brings out the sunshine, or inspires the angels to thunder the hallelujah chorus. The truth is, I think Psalm 88 has a place in our Bibles because it's true. It reflects how we feel sometimes. Yes, even those who have a passionate love for Christ. Do you feel as though God's wrath has withered you, whether for some good reason or for no reason at all? So did the psalmist. Do you feel as though his terrors are destroying you, surrounding you, completely engulfing you? So did the psalmist. Do you feel as though all your loved ones and companions have been snatched from you? So did the psalmist. Does the darkness feel like your closest friend? It certainly did for the psalmist. In chapter 6, we'll discuss some ways to deal with dark feelings such as this. But for now, I just want you to recognize that God knows such feelings exist. And he chose to honor them by including a record of them in his holy words. Why? Because those are words that may come from our hearts someday, if they haven't already. What's more, he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. That's Psalm 103, verse 14. Don't make the common mistake of trying to deny your feelings or pretending they don't matter or feeling guilty and condemned because you have them. While I don't counsel you to wallow in them, neither do I suggest that you hide from them or run away from them. Listen to one of my favorite quotes from Shakespeare's profoundly tragic tale, King Lear. The weight of this sad time we must obey Speak what we feel, not what we ought to say. Remember this. God sees your arms flailing, and he knows very well that you're not waving. You're going under for the third time. As the ultimate lifeguard, he's seen a lot of thrashing arms in the wild surf of life. Moses, if this is how you're going to treat me, put me to death right now. And do not let me face my own ruin. That's Numbers eleven fifteen. Job, why then did you bring me out of the womb? I wish I had died before any eye saw me. That's Job ten eighteen. David, what gain is there in my destruction, in my life going down into the pit? That's Psalm thirty verse nine. Jonah. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. Jonah 4.3 Elijah, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. 1 Kings 19.4 The disciples, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Mark 4, verse 38 Paul, we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the sentence of death. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 8 and 9. And Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. Drowning indeed. Broken Pieces Early in the morning, I love to take a mug of good, strong coffee out onto the patio and watch the sun rise. Our home backs onto a lake, and the beautiful scenery changes with the seasons. For all the loveliness and colour of that scene, however, my gaze always returns to a certain stone, a mosaic stone at the edge of our lawn. With its garishly bright colours and uneven shapes, you might think it looks a little out of place. 
but I consider it a priceless treasure. I remember the morning that my son, Christian, then seven years old, gave the stone to me. I remember it well for two reasons. First, this beautiful, homemade gift came from the heart of my little boy. And second, he almost collapsed my lungs when he thrust it upon me. As my birthday approached, Christian told his dad he wanted to make something special for me. After considering a number of ideas, they finally settled on a project Christian had seen advertised in a magazine, a mosaic stepping stone kit. The magazine showed a picture of a beautiful finished piece, and I think Christian imagined that's what he was ordering. So when the kit arrived and he opened it up, he felt very disappointed. Look, Dad, it's just a box of broken things. I can't give that to Mom. Barry explained that Christian would use the pieces to create his own pattern to make a -a one-of-a-kind gift. Once he caught a glimpse of the plan, Christian really liked that idea. For the next few days, the boys banned me from the guest bedroom, where they'd spread out the materials over a large towel until they could complete the masterpiece. Barry told our young son that he should pick and choose which pieces to use, but Christian felt determined to work in every single piece from the box. His creation wound up in poured concrete, so the finished piece weighed a ton. On the morning of my birthday, Christian came staggering into our bedroom carrying his gift in a box. He asked me to close my eyes and hold out my hands. I closed my eyes and prepared to hold out my hands, but when his gift got too heavy for him, he unloaded it onto my chest. It almost flattened me. We took the stone outside that very morning, and placed it right at the edge of the lawn by the patio. And even today, that's the first thing you see when you set foot outside. I love that stepping stone. I love the way Christian arranged all the pieces, giving prominence to purple, my favorite color. What I love even more is that just before the concrete set, he wrote in it, I love you, Mom, with his little finger. One morning, as I sat outside, gazing at the stone glimmering in the early light, Christian came out and joined me. Out of the blue, he asked a question. Mom, do you think someone broke the pieces on purpose, or do you think they just gathered up broken things and used them? I answered that I imagined they collected broken things, but his question stayed with me for a long time. In fact, I still ponder it. I think about all the broken pieces of my life and in the lives of those I love, the men and women I've encountered in my ministry, and I've asked God, Father, do you orchestrate the breaking of our lives or just invite us to bring all the pieces to you? Thinking about my question has led to another. Does it matter? Would we relate to God any differently depending on his answer? It's one thing to love God when we think of him as the one who binds up our brokenness. But what if he is the one who allows, even participates, in the breaking? Where is God? I sat outside again this morning, looking at my stepping stone and praying for some of my friends who currently suffer heartache and pain and brokenness. Two of them are embroiled in a bitter divorce. One spouse wants it and the other doesn't. I see so much hurt and anger there. I care deeply for both of them, but I can do nothing to help. I listen and weep and pray, but I can't fix their problems. I can't restore their marriage, undo the wrong turns made along the way, or bring healing to their hearts. Over the years, I've talked to many with failing marriages. So often they ask me, why won't God change my husband's heart? If God hates divorce so much, why won't he help me rebuild our relationship? I don't want my kids to be a statistic coming from one more broken family. I feel so helpless. Hands up, arms thrashing, not waving, drowning. Another dear friend struggles with brain cancer. He has an amazing family, each member rock solid in their faith. But his three young boys wonder what on earth is going on and ask some very valid questions. Does God hear our prayers? Why won't he heal my dad? Is my dad going to die? Not waving, drowning. My friends who struggle with infertility ask another set of questions. So do those who struggle with joblessness, financial ruin, or bankruptcy. 
Others, even in adulthood, continue to try to overcome the wounds of childhood abuse, neglect, or abandonment. Whatever the heartache, the questions ultimately sound the same. Where are you, God? Or where were you? Don't you see my pain? You say you love me, then how can you leave me like this? How can you turn away? Why won't you do something? With raised and frightened voices, we continue to ask the shrill question of the disciples, floundering on a waterlogged boat while their Messiah slumbered on. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Could you be asking that question right now? Will he pick up the phone? Years ago, a frantic man drove his sick wife hundreds of miles to visit the 700 Club, a daily religious program on the Christian Broadcasting Network, hoping that the prayers of televised saints would do more good for his sweetheart than his own tearful petitions. He apparently believed, as many do, that the moderately famous have better connections to heaven than do the seemingly anonymous. More than one woman has said to me something like, Sheila, God is more likely to pick up the phone when you call than when I do. These women really believe God is connected to you, but not to me. One distraught woman bitterly roasted me for several minutes over my perfect son. Her words. She let me know in no uncertain terms that she felt sick of me talking about his successes and was fed up with hearing about his marvelous spiritual growth. She despised these stories and hated every triumphant detail. And then she broke down and wept. Her own son had died unexpectedly, and she just couldn't bear the thought that God might spare one mother's heart but shatter her own. Her bitter disappointment with God over the loss of her son just couldn't help spilling over into every other part of her life. That was a broken woman, a woman for whom Christ died and whom God loved so much that he sent his own son to Calvary that he might prepare the salve that heals broken hearts. It sounds good, doesn't it? It has the ring of truth. We like the idea of a Savior-made potion powerful enough to mend our shattered, broken hearts. But we despise the brokenness itself. Oh, we may mouth the well-known verses about all have sinned and all we like sheep have gone astray, but generally we would rather not ponder, let alone deal with, the kind of desperate brokenness that our sin has bequeathed to us. But what is the alternative? Bitterness, like the woman with the dead son? Guilt, like the man with the deceased wife? Deep self-doubt, like the women who believed they had malfunctioning telephone lines? Or the agonizing death grip on the promises of the Lord, like the crucified and broken Son of God? You may know that when Jesus cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? His words echoed Psalm 22, verse 1, a prophecy of David about the Lord's crucifixion, given more than a thousand years before Christ's death. While that's remarkable enough, keep in mind that Jesus didn't merely quote those words from the cross in order to fulfill prophecy. No, those words were torn from the very core of his own soul, tortured, sorrowful, troubled, tormented. The very skies turned black from the horror of what was happening. We don't know exactly what mysterious divine transaction took place in those dark hours, nor will we likely ever know. Somehow, as Christ took on himself all the sins of the world, the Father looked away. And so the blessed Savior screamed his wail of abandonment as he was plunged into darkness that we will never know. But then the moment passed, as all moments do. And with Roman spikes still piercing his hands and feet, and with flowing blood still staining the wood of the cross and the dust of the earth, the real agony, the spiritual and emotional agony, abated. 
In his last moments, Jesus forgave a thief and made arrangements for the care of his mother. He cried out, It is finished. He had drained every last drop from the cup of the wrath of God and now commended his spirit into the care of his heavenly Father. What gave him the strength to recover like that? While I can't prove it, I think he did more than quote the first line of Psalm 22 in his darkest hour, an hour far, far darker than the blackest night we have ever known or will ever know. I think he mentally worked his way through the whole psalm. When we look at Psalm 22, many of us may focus on the startling prophecies that came so literally true at the crucifixion. Jesus' cry of desperation and abandonment in verse 1, the taunts and jeers of his cruel opponents in verses 6 and 7, the description of what happens physically to a man crucified, verses 14 and 15, the piercing of Christ's hands and feet, verse 16, the casting of lots for his clothing, in verse 18. We breathe a sigh of astonishment, and then we turn the page, but we turn too quickly. I believe that as Jesus continued to hang on the cross, he worked his way through the rest of the psalm, whose verses imply his resurrection, verse 22, the birth of the worldwide church, verse 27, and his ultimate reign over all the earth, verses 30 and 31. What kept our Lord going until the very end? How did he move from feelings of abandonment to utter confidence in the warm, welcoming, loving embrace of his Father? As he did all his life, Jesus laid hold of the promises and the truth of God's Word. I want you to know that for the rest of this book, I'll be telling a lot of stories and incidents from my life and from the lives of others, all in the desire to show you and God helping me convince you of the hope we have in Christ Jesus, no matter how broken we are. But remember, as you read, that none of these stories can do for you what the Word of God can do. And that is why I intend to root everything I say in Scripture. I love what author and pastor John Piper wrote at the beginning of his book, Desiring God. He said that if he could not show that his teaching came from the Bible, I do not expect anyone to be interested, let alone persuaded. I really like that. And I also agree with his next statement. There are a thousand man-made philosophies of life. If this is another, let it pass. There is only one rock, the Word of God. As we walk the rest of this journey together, I'd like you to train your eyes on two crucial things, one ancient and one new. The prophet Jeremiah gave us the ancient bit of this wonderful pair. This is what the Lord says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. That's Jeremiah 6.16. 6, this ancient path and good way is nothing other than the Word of God, the Bible. Throughout this book, you and I will return constantly to its wisdom and lean on its counsel. For if we want rest for our souls, that's the place to find it. There is a companion Bible study at the end of this book so that together we can dive deeper into the life-saving Word of God. Do you remember Stevie Smith, the poet who wrote Not Waving But Drowning? So far as we know, she never found the rest for her soul that she so desperately sought her whole life. She waved and she waved, and then she drowned. Clive James said of her, her poems, if they were pills to purge melancholy, did not work for her. Words, no matter how potent, simply lack the spiritual muscle to give our souls rest. For that, we need more than poetry or philosophy or human wisdom. We need the living, breathing 
Word of God. Isaiah gives us the second hook on which to hang our hats. Not only do we rest on the solid rock of the Word of God, but we are called to open our eyes and see what God is doing in us and preparing for us right now. God speaks through the prophet to tell us, See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Isaiah 43, 19 Too often when we feel as though we're about to drown, we let our focus lock into life's rear-view mirror. We see so clearly our mistakes, our obvious wrong turns, our skewed perspective, and the unhappy turn of events that mark our personal history. Well, that's the way it looks in the rear-view mirror. But who can drive anywhere looking in the rear-view mirror? That mirror has been strategically placed over the windshield so our eyes can catch a quick glimpse of all things behind before we return our gaze to all things ahead. We glance at the road behind, but we fix our eyes on the road before us. Some of us allow our hurtful past to absorb us, consume us, and hold us back. Whether we run from our past or live in our past, it continues to control us. But no one can drive that way or live that way. God says to you and to me, it's time for something new in your life. I open up new roads before you. I want to fill the desert of your soul with living water and satisfy your thirst with heaven's swift, cool brooks. Don't dwell on the past and refuse to camp in the tragedies of your history or family background. Leave it all behind and then come with me, for I have something brand new in mind for you. So with one hand firmly gripping the word of God and the other hand reaching for the fresh future God is busily at work preparing for us, let's walk together on this journey into God's best. It may be hard but it will be worth it.